Welcome to another episode of the Swim Swam podcast. I'm today's host, Coleman Hodges, and joining us today, she is the oldest woman to ever qualify for the Olympic trials at 46. She's a 22-time All-American for the Stanford Cardinal. She's a two-time Olympian, once for Brazil, once for the United States, two-time world champion, five-time world championship medalist. Today, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Gabby Rose. Gabby, how's it going? It's going really well. Thank you so much for having me here today. That was a very nice intro. I'm excited to hear about your swimming career. Obviously, it's it's been quite a long one, and there are a lot of different facets to it. So um, let's start with the present, and then maybe we'll kind of work our way backwards. Um, you just made your Olympic trials cuts uh, at, at age 46 in the 100 breast, which was near a best time, and the 200 breast. Um, I guess, so first off, can you tell us about those swims in particular and if Olympic trials was something that was on your radar? Yes. So it, we put it on the radar in spring of 2023 after Masters Nationals. Um, and it's an interesting story a little bit. So 2022, um, that summer, I had been training with Erica Hansen Stebbins at UCLA Masters, and I felt like I was in really good shape. We're doing long course every single day. Um, and I was, I was loving swimming and putting up some good times in practice. And I decided, um, I, I coach at Alpha Aquatics and our kids had a, had a meet and I decided to do a time trial of the 100 breaths because I just wanted to see where I was. And I went a 1.12.8, which I was thrilled with and happened to be a master's um, world record. So um, that summer, we decided to get a little more serious and see what I could do, you know, putting some intentionality and focus and, and going to taper. And I went a 1-12-2 at the end of the season. And so I'd actually set a goal for myself to get, or to get U.S. nationals. Like I think the time standards was a 1-10-9, but I was incredibly off that time, right? So I was like, oh yeah, the, the tents don't come off that easily, I forgot. So that was a nice pipe dream, um, kind of put that aside, but fast forward to spring of 2023, US Masters Nationals. I just wanted to go in and give my best performance, like really prep for that meet, take it seriously, do relays, um, have some fun. And a great thing happened in my 100 breast, I went a best, a lifetime best. So I think I went a 101 six never gone that fast in my life. And that was very exciting. And it put Olympic trials, getting that cut back on the radar because my coach, Scott Hubbard, was able to come back to me kind of with some data and be like, well, that time actually converts to a 110. So um, before I hadn't really considered it. And so then it became a curiosity. Could I actually get the Olympic um, trials cut? And then with the 200 breast at Masters and Nationals, that's the event that I was actually most, un or I was, I was happy, was delighted with everything else, but that event, I felt I left, I left something in the pool, didn't pace that quite right. And so I said, yeah, let's go for the, let's try to, you know, swim the hundred breast long course, see what I can do. But I also wanted to swim the 200 breast just to kind of see what I was really capable of. Um, however, with the 200 breast stroke, I've only swum that, um, or I had only swum that as an adult, um, as a professional athlete, uh, once with Dave Salo, I think in 2003 or 2002. So, so much, so I had swum it a lot as a, you know, 12 to 16 year old, but it was my first time, um, doing a long court, long course, 200 breaststroke in quite a long time. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> so so I guess you, can you tell us a little bit about um, your relationship with training and racing 
I guess just in the last decade, you you've held multiple masters records um, in the 35 to 39 and 45 to 49 age groups, uh, 14 I, to be exact, according to our article. Uh, and uh, you know what what has propelled you, or or how has your relationship with swimming and again with training and competing um, evolved just over the past decade? You know, as you've been pretty fairly far removed from your the the peak of your competitive career. Right. Um, master swimming is something I've always done ever since I retired in 20 uh, when I was 26. And it's something I've loved doing. Um, the thing I really like about master swimming is you make it relevant to whatever chapter you are in your life. Um, so sometimes it's just been for health mental well-being, kind of that meditation um, during COVID recently. It was like for, to have a sense of community, to actually see people. Um, but I've had great chapters with master swimming. So, and I, however, I, I wouldn't compete as a master swimmer. Like in my 20s, um, after being a professional athlete, that's the last thing I wanted to do. I didn't want to work on technique. However, when I was living in Chicago, I was part of a great master's team with a fantastic coach. Um, so with the Chicago Smelts, we went for the state championships, um, and that was a really fun experience, but I never looked at masters, national records. I was just, you know, it was a fun thing to do with a group of people that I really enjoyed being around. Um, and then in 2017, masters nationals were going to be in Riverside in California, kind of in, in my backyard. And so I was, I had moved from Chicago to California and decided it's a great chance to, um, to compete again and particularly to be relays. So a, a teammate of mine from Chicago Smelts was the head coach with the Santa Barbara Masters. And so I represented them and that was a, a great experience. I came away from that meet with one Masters record in the 100 IM, got beat a couple of times um, in other things, but I just thought it was a fantastic experience and um, kind of put that um, back of mind is something that I enjoyed doing. And sure enough, when Masters Nationals were going to be back in Southern California in Irvine, it was something I knew I wanted to do again. And this time, maybe take it even more seriously. I had added strength training back into my, into my training program in the fall of 2022. And I think that really helped. But um, Masters National is just a really joyful, exciting, fun meet, and I I wanted to challenge myself by really focusing on the breaststroke events and rating, racing Katie Glenn, and um, she, you know, she challenged me and helped bring out the best in me, and it was a really, really great experience all around. And then, you know, you mentioned this kind of, you had a time trial in 2022, and then the progression, the the tri chase for trials really started in 2023. What what did what did that flipping of the switch look like for you in terms of how did you change your training or <clears throat> turn up the volume, um, both physically and mentally? I guess. Yeah, I think the most important thing was just deciding that that actually was going to be a goal. So there was a lot of resistance, but just. Scott Hubbard, again, had to do a lot of convincing, but once I was in, I was in, and the goal scared me. I found it incredibly exciting, but it was, you know, what are people going to think? And here I was at a 112.2, and the the time that I had to get was a 110.2. So I didn't know how that was possible, but, you know, roadmap of my, of my life 20 years before um, when I made the U.S. Olympic team is, you know, having a big, scary goal, regardless of the outcome, will help bring out your best potential. So I knew, you know, I may not get this goal, but we're going to see what I'm capable of. And so, yeah, we decided to amp up the training. And so Masters Nationals, I think, was the last week in April. And the next long course meet, the next chance to race was the Speedo Grand Challenge, I think, three weeks later. And so we were in their training like the, the day after, after Masters Nationals. And I have a great training group at UCLA, so we do long course every day. Um, Scott also let me get in with the kids that I coach once or twice a week. So that, 
that's a fantastic opportunity to get his genius and expertise with breaststroke um, and raise some of the kids and um, just back in the right weight room. And so was, I was doing that very intensely for three weeks and then a one week rest cycle. And I dropped time. I think I got down to 111, 111 high in the 100 breast. And then the surprise takeaway from the Speedo Grand Challenge is I did redeem myself in that 200 breaststroke. And um, I went a 232 high. So the cut is a 31.6, but 232, I was like, oh, that's actually, I could possibly get it. And, and I was most surprised going from a 235 in the morning and thinking, oh my gosh, I've got to do another one of those this <laughs> evening. And I had paced that swim like I would a 200 free because that's all I'm used to. Like I'm used to doing 200 IM where you go from the start or 200 free where I'm, I'm going from the 75, but it's a whole different thing for me to pace a 200 breaststroke. And I... I was more patient and got a big drop in the evening. And so that that was exciting for me and kind of a new discovery that my stroke actually might be more suited for the turn of breast stroke. Wow. So we could we could be seeing even more best times uh, in the 200. Do you know what your best time in the 200 breast is? Um, it's The best time was when I went at the that Southern was... Pacific invite. Yep. That, that was, that was by, by a long, long shot. So I think I was 235 in high school and oh, wow. 235 when I swam it under Dave. Yeah. But I really struggled in, so I, I got the national age group record as an 11 and 12 year old um, mm -hmm. in the 1500 breaststroke. And I was going back and looking at our, at my best times. I, I grew up on Memphis Tiger swimming. And so I had the record 235. Um, when I was a 13, 14 year old, but then the best I could do as a 15, 16 year old was a 238. And I think then we just bailed on breaststroke. <laughs> it was, <laughs> um, I mean, that helped me find you know, under Rick Bishop, um, we found butterfly and I am, and that helped me get recruited to Stanford. Wow. Uh, I mean, that's, <clears throat> it's so nice that you and cool that you've been able to be so versatile throughout your career, do you feel like part of, do you feel like that having that versatility and, and being able to fall on different strokes or just maybe just enjoy racing different strokes has, is part of what's kept you engaged in swimming for so long? Definitely. I think it has made it fresh for me. There's always a challenge and there's always been something to kind of tackle or discover. So, um, just, new opportunities. And, and so when I was in high school, we, we weren't as much technique and there wasn't as much technique emphasis, but it was kind of the challenge of, could I move beyond breaststroke and still have success? And then when I got to Stanford, there was a lot of technique work. And so I really enjoyed that, that process of discovery with the different strokes. And, um, and then, you know, I'm just reflecting back to Stanford. There was one year I, I was injured. And so for a whole summer, all I could do is breaststroke. Um, so it wasn't my stroke, but that's, that's all I could do. And that was kind of something that, you know, not just to keep me mentally fresh, but physically fr fresh. That's the only thing I could do to stay in the water was breaststroke. So just, it's been nice to have those, those other strokes throughout my career. Yeah. <laughs> How much, how much breaststroke would you do when you were injured? Oh, just, I mean, it was the whole, it was the whole practice. Um, <laughs> and I would, I would get in, I'd warm up, see how much I could handle freestyle and be like, it usually was, couldn't get beyond much of the, much of the warm up. So I was often just, I, I started to love swimming on the side lanes. I'd be by the coaches and just modifying everything, kicking and swimming breaststroke. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that sounds kind of fun. It, it was, and I still, in master swimming, I will still go in the other lanes, like the sl slower paced lanes and happily swim long distance breaststroke. I really just enjoy the, the rhythm and um, feeling of it. Well, I, it's kind of funny because you, you see um, people just swimming in lap lanes. It, it pools across the country and, you know, some people can only swim breaststroke, right? I mean, yeah. the, that's like, that's their exercise. If they're like, Hey, I'm going to go swim 
for them, that means swimming an 800 breaststroke and yeah. then that's it. Yeah. I might be that swimmer one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is, yeah, not a, not a bad way to yeah. spend a swim. Yeah. So for, tra for you training now, you get to some long course every day, which is, which is very cool. What are you, what are your training sessions look like? You know, when you're, when you're training for trials and you have this goal of, yeah. of making that cut, uh, what, what do your pool workouts look like? Right. So this summer we learned a lot kind of trial and error. As I talked about, we had that intense three week training cycle before our speedo grand challenge. And then, you know, I fell short of getting the trials cut, but we had another opportunity five weeks later. And that was, that was kind of like, let's ramp it up even more. Um, and what we learned there is that a 45 year old athlete can't just <laughs> ramp it up and keep going. Um, I ended up getting COVID and that's, that's not really what took me out, but it was the cold after COVID where I just couldn't quite recover. Um, so we were, we had more workouts with the kids then, but I learned I have to really prioritize recovery and sleep and I become a lot more knowledgeable of, about those things. Thanks to that summer training period. Um, at that, at that um, LA invite, I got down to a 1108. So even though I had been sick, dropped some time, and now just six, six tenths off the trials cut. Um, but my 200 breast, I wasn't able to finish. So taking that learning, we applied it to the to the fall training and kind of had a different lineup. So I'd gotten some good long course training in the bank, um, and we were willing to switch it up a little bit. So I was swimming about nine to 10 hours a week. And I'd say three days of that would be pretty intense workouts. And so the intense days look like on Tuesday, 545 workout with the kids that I coach and Scott always does a breaststroke morning. So breaststroke technique, and that would kind of set me up for the week. And then we do some breaststroke threshold race pace training that morning. And then the evening would be a long course um, work out with the alpha athletes and again, more, more stuff off the blocks, more speed work and a little bit of endurance work. Uh, and then, um, Thursday coming full circle, I got to go back and train with Dave Salo with the Irvine Nova pro group. So two hour workout there, um, which is so hard at first, but I love being back at Nova and appreciating Dave even more, like being on the coaching side. Um, I appreciated him as a coach and of course, as an athlete. So that's probably the most intense training I do is that two hour workout with um, Dave. We do a lot, as, as you know, a lot of speed, power work, parachutes, stretch cords. And then the day after that, I would go back to UCLA with Erica and we do, Erica does her Friday sprint days. And so that would be fifties pace and then hundreds off the block, some version of that. And then, um, then we build in some flash recovery days and weight training and weight training was always like hitting it really hard. Um, two days a week, lots of explosive power speed type workouts. <laughs> this is this is amazing to me because <laughs> i i would say i'm an athletic person uh -huh. but i was nowhere i was not an elite athlete at any point in my life but like and i love working out every day but if i work out for more than an hour a day i'm like <laughs> i'm yeah. gassed i i don't you know it's like i <clears throat> training takes a lot out of you right and i'm amazed that you're not only able to to train as much as you are, but, but you're doing it with some of the best coaches and athletes in the world. You know, it's like, who do you get? To, I'm, I'm just curious. This is yeah. the swim fan of me. Who, do, um, who else is in the Nova Aquatics pro group with, with Dave Salo? Yeah. Um, I think we have all the way from, we have a 60 year old <laughs> and, and we have Jesse Novak who is, um, great sprinter from Irvine and Josh Hansen, who's just got a great attitude. And then, um, a couple of young bucks and, um, younger females. So, um, 
And then Dave has athletes pop in and train with him on a case, you know, for weeks at a time. So the group kind of is ever changing, but that's, that's the core group there. That's, that's so cool that Dave is not only still doing it, but yeah. you know, he, he has, he has a pro group and he's training, he, he's training athletes to be their very best, which yeah. is, which is great to see. Yeah. Um, so how I am I'm, I'm guessing throughout your career, you've picked up a lot of knowledge on just kind of what works for you, what doesn't work for you, um, mm -hmm. as an athlete, as a swimmer, probably as a human being. Um, how do you feel like you are able to not only recover, um, from all of this training, mm -hmm. but just train a little smarter than you may have as a 22 year old versus, um, now at 46, when, as you've kind of mentioned, your body just has different needs. Yeah. I think there's so much more knowledge and information out there that's really helpful and has made a difference. Um, I got to work with Erica Biney and do some genetic testing. And that was that summer of 2022. And I saw, you know, I was, I was someone who was probably skeptical of, oh, is nutrition really going to make that big a difference or like, I just didn't want to put the effort into it. Um, but once you have the information kind of broken down, like personalized to you, it's kind of hard to resist not at least trying. And so sure enough, like I leaned out, I felt better. Um, I'm, I'm so interested and I, cause just because I see so many athletes, yeah. um, work with her, what, what, what specifically were maybe some of your takeaways from that? Yeah, there was just things that I was doing that were leading to more inflammation in my body. And so like, mm -hmm. like that's going to happen. We're going to inflammation exercise induces inflammation, but it just made sense to me. Like, why am I going to add in extra stresses to my body? Um, so I have like a genetic mutation where I don't clear certain things from my body as quickly as other people. So just being more mindful of that. Um, folic, so that relates to folic acid, which isn't a lot of like pasta and wheat products. Um, I just, it's a, it's, it's not that I have to be gluten-free. I just, um, you know, try to get the organic version of that and trying to avoid dairy and, and then just like clean products, clean living. So just being more thoughtful about if my body's not clearing these toxins, from my body as readily as other people, what can I do to kind of minimize that? So I, I like it. I mean, I like the way I feel. And then of course, like fish oil, some supplements that all, that all I think helps. Um, and then with the, that recovery bit, you know, she's talking about getting rid of the toxins. So the, like a sauna bag or the Epsom salt soak and I now can do ice baths. I couldn't do, I, I could never have tolerated those when I was a pro athlete or in college. I remember trying to do those at NC2As, but I will happily do them now. I guess I'm like more informed that it really does work and I can, I can do it. So we're always thinking about just, you know, prioritizing, like, just like we have regular workouts for swimming or strength building. Like, what are we going to do this week? That's really like my recovery focus. So, and and I'm just more thought, like, as a, I guess, as a parent, as a coach, I'm just more thoughtful about, like, let's not just show up to work out, right? It's just not, like, the win isn't getting there. Let's think about how to really make the most of it. So before workout, I'm thinking about, you know, what 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 sports drink am I going to have in workout to fuel me? And then what, you know, protein drink am I going to have afterwards? And just being really smart about about those things and thinking about nutrition throughout the day. And yeah, it's a, it's a shift, but I feel like I'm, I'm much more capable about capable of thinking about those things as a 46 year old than I was as a 22 to 26 year old. I think some of that is, it's a different motivation. Like I don't just think of, but what I'm doing is things that are going to help me to get the Olympic trials cuts or to do well at trials. I'm thinking about overall longevity and my health and well-being and taking this time to learn more about myself to set me up for like enjoying more of my life, enjoying 
um, my life with my daughter and feeling health, healthy and happy and strong. And those are all things that I'm really enjoying right now. So yes, I do, you know, I get tired. Um, those two hour workouts after day, they wipe me out, but I, I loved being a professional athlete. It was such a good time for me and such a gift. And I, I feel so lucky when I can tap into those feelings of like, I'm getting to just really, really focus on my potential and learning stuff about my stuff, about, you know, about my strength and my body that is going to help me um, moving forward. And then another motivation is I'm coaching now. So whatever I do now is going to help with, with my coaching in the future. And so there have been races where I'm like, I don't want to do another 200 I am. not want to do that, but it is going to help me coach my athletes, help me understand them a little better. And so that helps me kind of get beyond myself. So I think the biggest difference now is just in terms of this, this feels bigger than me and just my little world with, with swimming as a, as a professional athlete, you know, 20 years ago, it's, it's now about something that it's going to pay forward to other people, the athletes that I coach, it's going to pay forward in my own life. And um, my daughter is a swimmer and, you know, I hope to be a good example to her also. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, the point of coaching, uh, because I know for me, I learned more in three months of, of being a coach as an 18 year old than I did my entire swimming career about <laughs> how swimming works and yeah. what is going to help you get from point A to point B. The, the, the best way possible. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, can you tell me a little bit about wh why you got into coaching um, and then what you have gained from it? You know, how, how you're swimming, ha in what ways has, has your swimming um, helped your coaching and vice versa? All right. Um, I got into coaching... So summer of 2021, so kind of after COVID, um, I was swimming masters and there was a really fast female all of a sudden showed up and was training with us and really enjoyed um, working out with her. And she was a Stanford athlete and a water polo player. Um, but we, we didn't really talk about whatever she was, whatever her experience with water polo was. And I like two weeks later, going through my phone, like going through the news. And I see this article about what it's like to be the last water polo player cut from the U S Olympic team. So it was an article about her, um, while I was training with her, her team was over actually over in Tokyo competing in the Olympics. And she sure enough had, had been cut right before they left, but her coach told her she needed to get better at swimming. And so she's in the water training. And like, when I, when I found that out, I was floored because that was not my experience in 2004 when I didn't make the team. I, I was not in a pool or anywhere close. And here she was just working her tail off. And it was really inspiring me. It was really inspiring. And so I wanted to help her. And so she had never been on a swim team before. So she had no technique work. So I kind of was kind of de facto coaching her. And it also pushed me like I had to all of a sudden keep up with this really she's super strong. Her name's Jordan Rainey. Um, and I had to keep up with her. And so that pushed me and, um, I was really enjoying the process of working with her and kind of trying to support her and help her you know, get better at swimming and happened to run into Scott Hubbard, who I've talked about from Alpha Aquatics at a UCLA meet. Um, and I think I must've had this coaching energy radiating from me, but he was looking for an assistant coach to help with the the high performance group at Alpha Aquatics and he asked me to come try it out and I was hooked and I'm I'm really lucky to be the, in the assistant coach role because I get you know Scott Scott is a genius with the workouts and making it fun but really challenging for the kids but my role is kind of quality control as I see it um, quality control and helping the kids with the technique and so watching them and then going back and swimming masters, I was kind of playing around with like, well, why is it so important that we're telling them these things? And Scott had these drills that I hadn't experienced before. So I'm like, I'm having to do them myself to learn, but it was, 
it was a deeper level of understanding the why behind certain aspects of technique. Um, and I had done master swimming mindlessly, like I really didn't want to work on technique for several decades, but this was an opportunity to go back and like, again, thinking about applying it and helping other kids and helping me become a better coach and articulating why things are important. So I think that is really, really, it, it turned on my brain. My brain had, that had kind of been <laughs> shut off. And so now I kind of can't let that go. Like I'm constantly thinking about ways to get better. And then it's like, well, if I think about it for myself, it's going to help the kids. Um, so coaching has helped me, again, appreciate discipline. Um, <laughs> I love the quote, you know, there's two paths of pain, the path of the, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Um, and so just the importance of discipline and consistency are things that I, I really can see and appreciate now that maybe I couldn't before. And then if I'm getting in the water with the kids and training with them, like I have to, I've got to hold myself accountable and um, walk the talk. And so I think that also pushes me to be a better athlete, just knowing that um, I've got, I've got to be a good example too. So I, I get so much from the coaching part of this and I can't believe it took me so long to get to, like, I really hadn't coached before. Like, so that's good. You had the experience when you were 18. I, I avoided it or didn't do it. And then at, at 44, got into it. Yeah. The, can you, can you tell me a little bit about yourself as a swimmer? when you were in high school and college and even as a, as a professional, you know, were you cerebral like that thinking about technique a lot or, or were you more of the pre 44 master swimmer Gabby that would just, just like threw technique out the window? Yeah. No, I love when I got to Stanford and we worked with Bill Boomer and Richard Quick was the coach and Ross Gary, the assistant, like there's a lot of emphasis on technique and it really, it changed my world. Like instead of swimming up and down a black line, um, swimming became a lot more fun and fulfilling. And there was always something to think about almost to an overwhelming degree. But I, I, I loved that. And I love the idea that you could improve just by focusing on technique. And I could really see, see the difference. Um, I became a sprint freestyler too at Stanford and you know, all those little details mattered. So it, it enriched my world incredibly, um, going to focus to on, on technique. And I think what I take back from my, you know, early years in swimming in high school is that, you know, those were the days of a lot of yardage, um, you know, fun variety wasn't necessarily emphasized, but I worked incredibly, like I was a, I was a workhorse and that was a, you know, that's how I got my confidence. So, and, and I still think that's really important. So I, I work hard and now really value technique and apply that. So it's, it's kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. When, um, <clears throat> was there, did you feel like there was a big difference when you went from training at Stanford under Richard Quick to going professional and training? Uh, did you train with Dave Salo from 2000 to 2004? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, what? Well, yeah, let's actually, at the very end of my career, I went and trained with Mike Bottom and swam with the Cal men's team. So, oh. Uh, yeah. Nice. So, yeah, some great, again, really great co coaches who really emphasized, shaped my career. Mike Bottom was the one who taught me the breaststroke that I use now and that I have loved doing in master's training ever since that experience in 2004, swimming with him. Um, so it's Stanford. So the question was, how, what was it like swimming at Stanford? And then what was it like going and swimming for with Dave. Yeah, I guess what were the the differences in, in training or, or coaching styles, I guess? Yeah, Richard, his great strength um, and what I'm forever grateful for is just his enthusiasm and belief and the type of team culture and environment that he created where 
I was around really fast females. Jenny Thompson was training there, Catherine Fox, Misty Hyman. I was, you know, inspired and he believed in me and he believed me enough to sit me down my freshman year and say, hey, I think you could make the U.S. Olympic team. You know, you swam for Brazil in, in 96, but you have the capacity to be one of um, these women here at Stanford and some for the U.S. team. So that's that's something that I embarked on. And I think that having that big goal pushed me and being on being a reliable relay swimmer for the Stanford women, I think helped unlock a lot of my potential or show me my, my potential. However, when I got to Dave, it just seemed like that was the right fit. I, I moved down to Nova um, with a hundred days before trials. So I'd actually stopped swimming at Stanford. I retired, um, <laughs> I thought after NC2As, and I, I was done with swimming, um, or I, I was done with school. So the spring quarter, I kind of was like doing some masters swimming, trying to figure out what I was going to do and realized I'd probably regret it if I didn't, you know, hang on until August and, and train. Called Dave up because he had been the Pan Am, one of the Pan Am coaches um, the year before. And I just, I was so intrigued by his training program. I was like, that looks fun. They are swimming fast. It was Steve West, Aaron Pearsall, Stacy on Stitz, and of course Amanda had been through his program. So like he's doing something right. It looks fun. If I'm gonna give it one last go, I wanna that's that's the environment I wanna be in. And it was just magic. Um, just loved being in the energy of doing that sprint training and you know, suspending my belief that this was it was so contrary to what I had been exposed to before. But you know, I just went all in and and the results, the results came, you know, like I took probably about four or five weeks, but, you know, sure enough, I was swimming, swimming fast times and training next to Aaron Pearsall. Um, I was focusing on freestyle, wanted to make a relay spot. So he was my, he was doing backstroke and that was, you know, one of the greatest training periods of my life, um, that entire atmosphere. And then I think we had five of us make the U.S. Olympic team that that summer. Whoa, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, super cool to hear about. I. <laughs> so then you went from retiring, then you make an Olympic team, and then and then you extend your career another four years. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, I had to retire again. <laughs> <laughs> so I retired. I was like, oh, I'm 22. You're supposed to be done. Oh, okay. That, was, that right. was a great last hurrah. Um, but was still trying to figure out what to do. And then so spring of 20, or 2001, so probably a nine-month period, went back to U.S. Nationals. And then that summer um, had moved out and was like fully training with Nova and I won the Kippeth Award, so the High Point winner at Nationals, and that was a big breakthrough meet for me and was able to get a Speedo contract that would enable me to be able to swim professionally. So, and that kicked off what I talked about, which is a great time as a professional professional athlete. I really love that period of my life. Yeah. What do you feel like um, you gained just from being a college athlete to a professional athlete that maybe you've even taken <clears throat> to, to this point in your career now. Um, cause I think, I think we just hear a lot about, um, it's a whole different ball game in terms of having a lot more autonomy. Mm -hmm. You're, you might be training with a team, but you're not necessarily competing with one. And you know, it's a, it's a lot more you focusing on you. Right. I think I was, I was ready for that. Um, you know, I love college swimming. I love realize I lo like what being part of a team did for me and showed me I was capable of, like I'm forever grateful for, but, but you're also, the team is the highest goal, right? And so there's some recognition on some level that you're not getting your best, like individualized training because the team has to be the highest priority. So I enjoyed collaborating with Dave and he was the first coach that kind of 
or yeah, he, he really welcomed that. And a lot was on me. And at first that was, um, I, I didn't like that at all. And I was, I was scared of it, you know, not having the coach be the end all be all of everything, but he'd asked me, well, what do you think? And, um, I was a responsible party in the process. And, uh, while that was scary at first, I came to embrace that and just get even more curious. Like I would come in after, you know, the day after a meet, okay, this is what I think we need to work on. Can you help me with this? What do you think I need to work on? And so I, maybe that's the early days of me coaching, <laughs> coaching, coaching myself, but, um, and he's, he set up something very special at Nova where I wasn't missing like the college and other pro swimmers who are training with college programs. Like when the college athletes go off to their championships, they're kind of left behind. I didn't have that at Nova. There were always people going to the same meets as me and um, similar goals. So it was a great, great environment for that. Yeah. So, so it, it all sounds uh, really pretty, really pretty great. Um, you've gotten to work with a lot of coaches and uh, <clears throat> you know, now, now you're still going best times uh, nearly two years after your professional retirement. Um, so congratulations on that. I never asked this question, yes. uh, but what was it like when you made your trials cut? You know, you, you had this goal as a, as a 40 something and, it's a pretty, pretty lofty goal, I'd say. And you got it. I mean, I was thrilled and maybe more than anything, just relieved. Um, it had gotten to the point over the summer where I knew I could do it. So at one point it seemed kind of like, oh, this is a, cra this is a crazy goal. But then I as I was training and seeing my progress, um, I was like, I can do this. And then experiencing getting sick and not being able to be at my best and see what I was capable of over the summer was a big frustration and disappointment. So then it became, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm going to like, I could, I have this in me, but I don't know if I'm going to like this, I'm going to be able to see my capacity or my potential at a meet. And actually the week before I, I made the trials cut, I was sick in bed. Like I, I've never been so sick um, on a taper. So, um, I, I really couldn't do anything except like take my daughter to school and I would go swim like bare minimum, but like, again, not no pace 50, like I could, I could go for maybe 10 seconds fast. Um, and so I didn't know what to expect going into that, um, the Southern Pacific invite. And I think that might've been good for me because the, the, the process of focusing on a cut is not something that I've ever done before. So I have, again, one of those things that helps you with coaching athletes. I have a lot of empathy for people who are like focusing on this one cut. And it was kind of, I did not handle that well. So I could, you know, intellectually make the leap that yes, if I just do my best or what I'm capable of, I'm going to, I, I can get it. But there was something about having to cross that hurdle, which I thought was getting in my way. And so maybe getting sick and not having the expectations and you know that i made the cut in a time trial um after i'd been sick all week and my coach going into that thought it was genius of him was like we're just gonna see where you're at you know i just want you to build it if you go 112 that's totally fine let's in and, and so like no pressure no expectations and it happened so i was <laughs> delighted and um yeah, relieved. And I'm, I'm happy to be back in the boat of now let's just see what I'm capable of doing. Let's just dream big and see what I can do rather than having to clear a hurdle to get there. Yeah. I mean, I've always thought getting sick was the best way to taper. <laughs> you, uh, it forces you to like, just yeah. stay in bed. Like you said, you were swimming a little bit, but you weren't really doing that much. And I, one time I was talking to Eddie Reese and he said, if I had the guts to do it, or like, I always thought that you should just like not swim for a week before your big meet, but I've never had the, the guts to, to try that yeah. with any of my swimmers. <laughs> um, but that's always how I thought would be the best taper. And I always thought that was interesting, but 
um, that's that's super cool that it worked out for you. Yeah, and, I, would, I, go ahead. I was going yeah, through yeah. archives of like, I remember like Richard Quick telling me a story about Rowdy Gaines being sick before a big meet. And then of, <laughs> of course there's Rex Maurer before his great swim, you know, for his high school record. But then I was like, well, but they weren't 46. So I don't know if that actually applies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you know. Yes, yeah, it uh, might work. <laughs> you may. exactly. Um, but but also, yeah, you you answered my my follow up question a little bit. Um, just where are you at now, and and what what does the road ahead look like? Um, first of all, are you going to be at? Are you going to go to Olympic trials? I'm so excited about going to Olympic trials. Yes. And, awesome. and my and my daughter will be there to watch. So yeah. Uh, so then, yeah. What is what is now until then look like for you? Um, do you do you have racing goals or, or training goals from from now until then? I'm. We're kind of in a regrouping phase here. Definitely like reflecting, celebrating, and in the, what I call like the dreaming phase. I will commit you know, goals to pen and paper. And I think that's an important part of this process. Um, however, just trying to get health. I was still, I was still sick after the meet. So um, kind of emphasize getting healthy and just re, you know, refocusing on the other priorities of my life. Um, I'm back in the weight room and now going three times a week, working on strength training and less of an emphasis on on swimming and then that will shift after the holidays and we'll get back to a good schedule going back to see Dave um, at, at Nova. And yeah, I think we learned a lot of good things. So I'm not sure exactly what we shift, but it will be a good balance of hitting it hard a few days and, and the strength training and recovery work. And um, I'll focus on sectionals in March and hopefully one of these, um, you know, national level competitions. I haven't been able to do those because I'm, because when I unretired from the national team, I'm, I was put back in the drug testing pool. So I have to wait um, six months before I can, you know, couldn't go to US Open or um, other meets. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to race at that level also. No kidding. I, I always forget about the the drug testing pool yeah. bit of yeah. officially retiring slash yeah. unretiring. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, Gabby, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and uh, tell us tell us about your swimming journey. It is a really obviously unique one, and um, I really appreciate you sharing it with us. Uh, any any parting thoughts or anything we've missed? for our audience before we sign off today? Oh. Um, I was trying to think. I think we've covered, I think we did a very good job. I think you were very thorough. I appreciate the thoughtful questions. Can't think of anything, I guess. Um, you know, you asked me like kind of what's different now. And I think with, with my age and kind of having the second shot or go around to go to be at trials, I do so with a lot of gratitude and appreciation, of course, perspective that only comes with age. And so that's also just extra motivation or energy, just re realizing how like truly finite this time is and helps me make the most of each day, but do so with um, gratitude and and a lot of, a lot of good energy. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.